My name is Mike DeLacluse, President of Lessman Instrument Company. I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us for when measuring trace oxygen is critical to your process. Uh, today's speaker is Ken Solon from Baker Hughes GE. Ken is going to discuss trace oxygen measurement and the instrument solutions used to measure O2 in, in industrial process and metrology applications. In this 45-minute webinar, we're going to cover some applications where trace measurement is critical. We're going to re review oxygen measurement technologies, some tips for successful trace oxygen measurement in your process, and then uh, some case studies and success stories. Uh, if you have any questions, there is a question tool built into GoToWebinar. Just go ahead and type into that tool. I'll monitor it and make sure that uh, Ken gets the questions. With that, Ken, I'm going to turn it over to you and move on to slide two for you. Oops. Yeah, that's, move that's too fast. fine. There we go. Okay, so basically, uh, just to reiterate the agenda, we're going to focus on uh, two uh, oxygen measurement principles, paramagnetic and electrochemical. We're going to review the instrumentation, uh, the sampling systems required and a few case studies and then hopefully we can have a bit of a discussion on what parameters are needed to choose the right technology for the right application and i, I think of it as akin to any tool um, if you could even use the shoes as an example if you went to a shoe store uh, you know there, there are a variety of different shoes there are dress shoes there are work shoes there are steel-toed boots and uh, knowing a little bit about how you're going to use those shoes, if you want to go hiking, it's going to be a little bit of a different shoe than if you uh, were going to a wedding and you, you needed um, more fancy shoes. So uh, oxygen uh, sensors and transmitters are somewhat uh, the same in that it really is application dependent. We can go to the next slide. All right, I'll go to the next slide. There we go. Yeah, I, I can't flip the slide. So, so the, the first uh, technology we're going to talk about is paramagnetic oxygen. And uh, oxygen is drawn to a, a magnet. And in the picture you see there, you see a very strong magnet. And, and what someone did was to pour some liquid oxygen uh, through the poles of the magnet. And you can see that there's sort of a greenish whitish fog suspended between the magnets and that's because the, the oxygen molecule in itself has a magnetic attraction or an attraction to a magnetic field uh, we can go to the next slide and uh, the way our sensor works is uh, we have a strong magnet in the cell and as the sample gas flows through it we also have uh, two sets of thermistors and those thermistors act as little heaters because we're elevating the temperature and energizing those thermistors as gas containing oxygen passes across a heated surface it loses some of the attraction to the magnet so it's not as, as much drawn to the magnet as it's heated. The colder it is, the more attracted it is uh, to the magnet. So that actually creates a bit of differential pressure, or we like to call it wind. And wind, uh, just like you're, if you're on a, outside on a windy day, you're going to feel cooler. The wind or the differential pressure across the wind receiving thermistor is uh, going to uh, cool down. And the difference between the temperatures of the two thermistor pairs uh, are going to be directionally proportional to the oxygen concentration. So what we've done is to basically have a strong magnet, a heating system to precisely control the temperature. And uh, we have a bridge circuit that measures a voltage, which is a function of the difference in resistance. And that voltage then being directly proportional to the oxygen concentration. 
Now, the nice thing about this is that it can be very rugged because there aren't any moving parts and the wetted components are very inert. Uh, there, there's no, virtually nothing to wear out. These are glass coated uh, thermistors. We can, we can go to the next slide. The other type of power magnetic sensor is what's called a dumbbell. Now, we don't carry this particular sensor, but I just thought it would be worthy of uh, you know, presenting it. Uh, what we have are two spheres that are filled with nitrogen. And as oxygen gets in the field, it displaces the nitrogen and it causes the spheres to twist. And in the middle of those two spheres, that are suspended between two magnets is a mirror and light reflects off the mirror. So there's a photocell that receives the light reflecting off and then that photocell receives less of a signal, it applies current, to make the magnet stronger to restore the spheres back in their original position. So the amount of current it draws to restore the spheres uh, is directly proportional to the oxygen concentration. It's a pretty good system, but one of the downsides is that it's very fragile. It, the, um, the spheres are on a very thin wired fulcrum, and this unit can be uh, subject to vibration and shock, whereas the thermal magnetic system has no moving parts, and oftentimes it's a very stable system for industrial applications. We can go to the next slide. So the, uh, the thermal paramagnetic uh, manifests itself in a transmitter, and this is an explosion-proof transmitter. It's a four-wire transmitter because we need uh, current to heat it. So the, the heater circuitry draws more current than what you can power on a loop, but it still put, provides a linear four to 20 milliamp signal. And it's in a uh, explosion proof casing. Uh, you can also get it in a bench top unit. It comes with the various uh, explosion proof uh, certifications. Uh, has a pretty good range. You could uh, use it for up to 100% uh, oxygen, and it can uh, also go down below 1%. But once we get into PPM levels, there are other technologies that are probably better. So it's a good percentage level uh, sensor. Now, uh, with any oxygen sensor also, you have to periodically purge the sensor with a zero and span gas to calibrate it. Uh, so these can be cylinder gases. So very often the system will have inputs for the zero and span gas, often the zero gas is uh, pure nitrogen. Uh, next slide. And this next graph just shows the response time. Uh, standard atmospheric air is 21% oxygen. Uh, so if we, we calibrate it uh, such that it's in that range, here we just see a step change from 21% and we're purging it with nitrogen. And we, we can see that um, Certainly within five minutes, we have uh, full stability. Uh, we get most of the change within uh, a minute and a half. So it's, it's a very good response, a pretty fast response. Uh, and purging oxygen out of uh, a system is always more difficult than the other direction. You can see that in the other direction, if we make a step change from nitrogen to ambient air, it, it seems to go up faster. It's, it's a lot easier to uh, expose it to oxygen than it is to purge all of the oxygen out. Uh, next slide, please. Well, this is just an overview of the typical applications that the uh, thermal magnetic uh, sensors are used in. They're used a lot in inerting, in ozone production, in uh, refinery applications, in uh, landfill and biogases, wastewater, and uh, another area of solvent recovery. Uh, I'm gonna go to the next slide. One of the most important applications that we run across is inerting. Of course, if you have a tank of 
uh, let's say gasoline or any flammable liquid, uh, the headspace above the liquid is the most dangerous. Uh, you, you know, for example, gasoline, it's not so much the liquid gasoline that's going to ignite, it's, it's the gasoline vapor. And of course, uh, three things are needed to have combustion or fire or explosion. You need fuel, uh, you need oxygen, and you need either a heat source or an ignition source. Above a critical temperature, you can have auto ignition. Uh, from heat. So we call that the combustion triangle. And if you take away any of the legs of the triangle, you can't have combustion. Uh, so in this case, typically for storage, we're taking away the oxygen leg of our combustion triangle. And that's done by purging the headspace of these tanks or reactor vessels uh, with nitrogen, uh, typically. Now, nitrogen uh, can be expensive, so this, this system can be used as a feedback controller to purge the headspace on demand to maintain the system below the lower explosion level for different chemicals, different liquids. That LEL or lower explosion level will be different. Uh, typically, it runs between 4 to 8 percent, uh, depending on the particular chemical. Next slide, please. Now, we don't put the sensor directly in the headspace. We normally draw a sample out. And this is a, a plate with all of the sample system components as a turnkey system. Uh, the, the gas or the headspace is drawn in and uh, might be drawn in via a vacuum pump or inductor. And there's a liquid trap that separates out, out any liquids. The, the gas is then filtered and sent through our uh, transmitter, which operates at atmospheric pressure. Uh, there's also the accommodation of the inlet valves for the zero and uh, uh, span calibration gases and some uh, rotometers just to uh, observe the flow or see how much you're flowing through. There's an optimum flow rate and a pressure gauge as well. Uh, next slide. So, so I think it's uh, sort of best illustrated by just giving a couple of uh, case studies. Uh, one of our customers is uh, Alpha Laval, which is formerly Alaborg or Smith Gas, and uh, they they provide uh, inerting systems for tankers. And what they use is the product of combustion from their engines. Uh, which is mainly CO2 and nitrogen, and they clean it up using seawater as a coolant and uh, condense out all of the soot and contaminants. And then they use that clean product of combustion to blanket the, the oil bunker or the, uh, the oil tanks on, on shipboard. So, of course, they need a pretty rugged system as this is a marine vessel. You can actually see a picture of uh, the little red box on the corner is, is our analyzer and transmitter on this uh, product of combustion uh, uh, cleanup system that's, that's going to be now pumped into the headspace of the, uh, of the tankers. So there, there are several of these, a uh, couple hundred of these on ships uh, globally. Uh, next slide, please. Another application is we work with Arian, who makes, uh, in, in Louisville, they make um, vapor recovery units. So in a similar vein, uh, oxygen is needed in, in the vapor recovery, a similar vein as the uh, storage tanks. And I'm just going to go to the next slide. And another area would be reactor vessels. Very often, they're chemical components that need to be devoid of oxygen either for the, the process or they need optimum option oxygen levels for the process or they need to keep that reactor vessel from igniting. Uh, so the same principle applies. Uh, the sensor provides a feedback signal to in turn uh, purge the inert gas in on demand. Uh, so we do a lot of these sort of 
customized sampling systems uh, per the customer's requirement. Um, we have standard ones, and then we modify those for a various uh, sort of specialized application. In this case, the, the zero and span calibration are done through an automated process where rather than hand valves, solenoid valves are used, but the whole system has to be uh, certified for hazardous area reuse. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just uh, on an offshore rig again on a, uh, uh, a floating platform. So uh, this platform essentially is is like a, a, a mini refinery or actually quite a big vessel, but it's a, ref a floating refinery. And uh, these these platforms are uh, off of Africa. And again, it's uh, just to support the um, refinery operations in terms of oxygen measurement. This one, because it's offshore, you have to go to uh, 316 stainless steel on the transmitter for uh, corrosion pro uh, properties, uh, being that you have salt, uh, water spray all around. Next slide. So the next technology for oxygen measurement I'm going to talk about is the um, galvanic fuel cell. And you can think of this sensor as almost being like a battery. Your, your car battery uses lead. It uses an electrolyte, uh, acid. And uh, as that lead combines with oxygen, uh, it produces electrons. So here uh, we have a sealed cell. Uh, instead of uh, acid, we use an alkaline electrolyte. We use potassium hydroxide. And this cell is, is removable, so the sensor can be replaced. Uh, so as oxygen permeates into the cell, uh, it will combine with the lead to produce a current, and that current is directly proportional to the oxygen concentration. Uh, this unit is loop powered. It provides a four to 20 milliamp signal, and it's, it's, it's quite a, a compact unit. Uh, Fully programmable, and you can also use it in a hazardous environment by means of uh, wi either wiring it through a safety barrier or a Zener barrier. barrier. But the unit by itself does have Division II uh, certification. Now, one of the nice things about this technology is you can just expose it to ambient air and calibrate it to ambient air. There, there's no uh, zero adjust on this is only a span and calibration uh, that's required. The next slide, please. So here we just see the response of it, the step change, uh, a little bit slower than the other sensor from uh, 21%, uh, but certainly uh, a, a very good sensor. Um, and, and likewise, you can see that the upward step change is a little bit faster. So here we, we did the step change in about five to six minutes. Next slide. The, the sensors are available in various configurations. You can get a percent level, and you can also get a sensor that's sensitive to part per million level. And a lot of times we're working in applications where the absence of oxygen is required, so we're down in very, very minute levels part per million level. So here we just show a step change uh, from 1,000 ppm uh, down to virtually zero. And we can go to the next slide. And this is 100 ppm to virtually zero again. So uh, in this case, you can see that from 100 ppm oh, to about five or six ppm, uh, actually took a couple of hours, but it, the initial change is quick, but to get those last remaining molecules of oxygen registered or out of there, uh, it takes uh, considerable time. Now it will go upward in the other direction quite fast. Uh, next slide, please. And again, uh, we can assemble it uh, in a, uh, a turnkey sampling system, and this is a pretty basic one where we have a pressure regulator 
that knocks the pressure down. We have a filter. Uh, the, the gas passes through the sensor and then vents out through a rotameter just to uh, regulate and, and observe uh, the flow. But we can add other components and temperature control. We can add a vacuum pump uh, and uh, so forth. Uh, this we can add a power supply uh, as this unit operates on DC voltage. And we can go to the next slide. Now at, uh, at BHGE, uh, we source the Delta F non-depleting electrochemical cell. There's a bit of a misspelling there. That should say electrochemical. So the one you saw before, the OxyIQ, that cell eventually will deplete. It's like a battery. And after so much use, it will deplete. How quickly it depletes, depends on the concentration of oxygen. So if you expose it to high oxygen concentration, uh, the sensor will deplete faster. A typical cell of the other type uh, will last about nine to 12 months if exposed to 21% uh, oxygen. So we recommend uh, replacing the sensing element on a yearly basis. With this sensor technology, you can think of it as almost being like a wet cell battery. Uh, there's an electrolyte in it, and it works on the same principle. You have a, a lead uh, electrode or uh, anode, and uh, there's actually two of them, and there's, there's no depletion over time. Now, you do have to top up the cell with distilled water, and this particular technology is very good for part per million level, even part per billion levels. It has a very good response. It has a much faster response to the part per billion uh, levels. And what we've done at GE is we've built in the circuitry to accept the raw signal into our analyzer and also make it intrinsically safe. Our analyzers have a built-in safety barrier, an intrinsic safety barrier to allow you to operate uh, this particular sensor in a hazardous zone. Now you can also get a, a variety of different electrolytes. There's one called Stabel, which um, has a neutralizer in it. So if you have acid uh, gas, then the, uh, the Stabel will neutralize the acid. And we can go to the next uh, slide. So typical applications for the galvanic technologies are just ambient air monitoring. We do a lot in micro environments or glove boxes, and those can be for electronics or food processing or pharmaceutical processing that where you have a an atmosphere where you want to control or make the atmosphere devoid of oxygen. Another big area for us is in uh, metal processing and welding very often, you have to have a shield gas to prevent the weld from rapidly oxidizing. And of course, in metal processing, there's a lot of application, uh, such as in sheet steel and annealing, galvanization, where uh, you want the environment or the furnace atmosphere to be devoid of oxygen. We can go to the next slide. So as I mentioned, our arc welding uh, is, is a very good application for us. The supply gas has to be inert, and typically argon or nitrogen might be used as a shield gas. And you'll see this a lot in, in robotic welding as well. There's a, in, in the welding head, there's a line of argon or nitrogen coming in. Argon is used a lot in aerospace uh, welding, and that keeps the work from oxidizing as the weld is going on. Particularly in uh, TIG welding and MIG welding, TIG is tungsten inert gas and MIG is metal inert gas, uh, is, is where these are used. Now, very often, the, the supplies themselves, you know, either a cylinder or 
a big a big tank that might be outside. That supply might be devoid of oxygen, but what oxygen has a tendency to ingress in the lines and fittings that between the source and uh, the working head of, of, of the welding operation. So very often uh, you, would, you would put this uh, sensor at point of use to ensure that uh, the shield gas is devoid of uh, oxygen. Next slide, please. In uh, making contact lenses, the soft contact lenses, uh, that's done in a oxygen-free environment. So these are uh, lades, actually, and it's quite amazing to see uh, up at Bosch and Lama in Rochester, I had the opportunity to see this operation, but a very thin plastic contact lenses are actually cut from a big cylinder of plastic and they're, they're cut on a lathe actually uh, and they can they can make the different lens shapes to different you know uh, powers or different corrective lenses uh, uh, with precise machining uh, so of course oxygen has to be uh, tightly controlled in that operation what they like about this is the the compact transmitter is really minimal maintenance on the sensor. You just have to replace the sensor once a year. And replacing that sensor is akin to replacing a battery uh, in a device. It, it, it's a, a little uh, cylinder, a little disc that's uh, replaced in the uh, transmitter. We can go to the next slide. We also sell these to the OEMs who make the glove boxes. Uh, one of our customers here in Massachusetts is uh, LC Technology. So they integrate uh, both our oxygen sensor and our trace moisture sensor uh, into their uh, glove boxes. We can go to the next slide. So as I mentioned, uh, one of our key applications that we get involved with is in metal processing. And uh, very often we're making three measurements in the atmosphere, moisture through our moisture sensors, we're making oxygen sense, uh, measurements, and we're making hydrogen measurements as well. So there you just see a turnkey panel that's gonna draw a sample from the furnace and that, of course, that furnace gas is hot, very uh, a lot of particulate in it. Uh, so it all has to be cooled and cleaned up. We have an integrated sampling system with a, um, in this case, we have a, a lamb's wool lanolin filter to knock out the soot that comes out. And uh, in this case, we're actually using one of our laser hygrometers to, to measure the moisture. So uh, ArcelorMittal, of course, makes um, uh, sheet steel. Uh, next slide, please. So another ArcelorMittal plant, uh, just showing another turnkey system. Uh, in that one, down in the bottom, you can see the, the Delta F uh, sensor. Uh, and they need that to get the sensitivity down into the part per million level in, in making uh, sheet steel. So in sheet steel, they're gonna inject hydrogen into the furnace and hydrogen is a scavenger for oxygen or it will, when you have metal oxide, the hydrogen will scavenge at, at elevated temperature and combine with the uh, oxygen actually to make water and then you're left with the bright and shiny metal or steel. Uh, next slide, please. Well, one of the things that uh, you always see in industry are requirements for industrial gases. Uh, regardless of if you generate the gases on your plant, on your site, or if you bring them in by rail or truck or even just via cylinders, uh, very often in industry there are requirements for uh, purity of these gases. And they often have uh, dew point and oxygen uh, requirements. Uh, here we see, for example, these are technical grade 
uh, nitrogen less than 0.001% and in argon less than 0.005%. So very often our uh, sensors or transmitters are just used to confirm that uh, these gas sources are devoid of oxygen. We can go to the next slide. So this, this slide is really just pointing out that even though your generate your storage tanks might be devoid of oxygen, there's a long distance from those tanks to the distribution center that might be mixing gases or delivering the gases at the right pressure to the points of use. And uh, the longer that distance, the more and the more fittings and things along the way, uh, the more possibility of ingress from the ambient air, because remember, ambient air normally contains 21% oxygen. And very often we're wanting to have part per million level uh, in the, or less, in the uh, supplies into the individual work barriers or, or work stations that we're delivering the gas to. Uh, next slide, please. So now we get to sort of uh, choosing the right technology. And what we've done here is kind of make a report card on the various criteria uh, of range, speed, accuracy, packaging for industrial and explosion proof, uh, whether we can get to trace levels or whether it's suitable for oxygen purity and a relative idea of the cost. So, as I mentioned with the shoes, there isn't. One of the key ways we can help you in choosing the right technology is if you return to us an application data sheet. And it's just a convenient form for capturing the information. Uh, we want to capture what the a little bit about what the application is, the gas composition, whether a contaminants, what utilities do you have available? Do you have AC power? Do you have chilled water available? Um, what environment will we use it? If it's next to a furnace, that might be very hot. If it's outdoors, we may have to put a heater in the cabinet to keep the temperature up in the wintertime. Uh, what sort of maintenance is in, uh, do you have available or would be involved? Uh, what particular range are you measuring? Is, is it down in the part per million level? Or is it in single digit percent? Or is it in purity kind of percent, close to a 100%? And then lastly, uh, the sample system requirements uh, are, will usually be reviewed. So this uh, application data sheet just makes it convenient uh, way of capturing that information and if nothing else it does ask you to fill in your name and email and phone number so that's often very helpful <laughs> sometimes we get these application data sheets and there's no name on them so sometimes it's difficult to get back to you uh, with that uh, I think that, that concludes uh, and uh, open it up for questions and discussion all right, Ken, thank you very much. While we're wrapping up here, if anybody does have any questions, feel free to type it into the tool. Uh, or if you want to give me a call specifically, feel free. I can be reached at 809 Lessman or 800 953 7626. If you don't know your account manager, again, just ask for me. You can also send me an email at mikeD at Lessman.com and I'll uh, make sure that your questions get answered. If you want to know more about some of the other technologies we supply, please follow us on social media. All of our webinars are posted both on our website and on the Lessman Instrument Company YouTube channel. If there are some topics that you'd like us to cover in future webinars, again, just send me an email with the subject. We've got lots of, uh, we've got access to lots of product and process specialists. So let me know what you'd like us to cover and uh, we'll get the specialist to cover the topic. Uh, Ken, we still don't have any questions coming up, so uh, I think at this point we'll go ahead and conclude the uh, webinar. Thanks for uh, helping us figure out the technology challenges and glad we were able to get it done.
Okay, very uh, good. And my contact information is uh, posted there as well. So if anybody wants to email me or call me, I'm, uh, I'm happy to talk to you. Great. Thank you very much, Ken. Have a good okay, day, everybody. Very good. Okay, bye-bye.